Hello and welcome to the Temple of the Silver Stars public class series, Selections from Magic Without Tears by Alistair Crowley. My name is Ruth and with me is Rex. Hello. Uh, Rex is my co-host for this class series. Uh, we are both academic track instructors with the Temple of the Silver Star. Um, let's see, we are a nonprofit or bulimic organization. We've been around about 12 years and we provide two tracks of training, academic and initiatory. Uh, right now you're kind of seeing the more uh, academic side. Um, both tracks were designed to provide preparatory training in ceremonial magic, Raja Yoga, Kabbalah, Tarot, Astrology, and much more. Using these foundational tools, we seek to guide the student towards a deeper apprehension of the true will, the law of Thelema, and his or her own psycho-spiritual constitution. You can visit our website, totss.org, to learn more about joining the academic track or being an initiate. Um, and we have academic uh, campuses and study groups all over the world. Um, I'm in Los Angeles. We have a Southern California study group. And uh, Rex right now is kind of spearheading our Pacific Northwest uh, Seattle group. Um, but, you know, obviously we can't meet in person, so we're doing this online. So this is kind of like a, a co-hosted event by the two um, study group and campuses. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, this is a series of weekly interactive classes discussing selections from Magic Without Tears. And tonight we'll be covering chapters 51 and 61. So 51 is how to recognize masters, angels, and how they, et cetera, and how they work. And 61 is power and authority. Um, I thought I'd put the two together, kind of makes sense. Um, you know, one is sort of like where Crowley is getting his power from, and one is where sort of he advises you to get your power and authority from. Um, so yeah, Rex, uh, we talked a little bit before we began, but is there anything you wanted to say that was remarkable about these two chapters? Well, I think, you know, to kick it off, the, uh, you know, first one in chapter 51, I think is a, a pretty good, uh, example of the types of synchronicities that Crowley was used to experiencing. And as uh, magicians, we, we oftentimes do experience all kinds of synchronicities throughout our, our daily experience. And I think it's really interesting, these excerpts from um, his confessions, uh, his book of confessions uh, are, some of them I've, I've heard before, uh, some of them are fairly uh, well, well known, but um, they're pretty good ex examples of the types of, uh, of uh, contacts that Crowley was, was accustomed to. Yeah, I kind of was expecting this to be a little bit more instructional and it was kind of just a series, the chapter 51, uh, just a series of like excerpts from his autobiography that he wrote. Um, I think it has a different title, uh, you know, in, in the um, actual text, The Spirit of Solitude. Yeah, that <laughs> um, was interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, you can read it now. Um, it's it's on, uh, what is it, hermetic.com, our favorite uh, website. You can read it for free. Uh, it's called Confessions and it's an autobiography. So it's, you know, a lot, lot more of examples like this of him being like, here's how I got into the Golden Dawn. Here's how, you know, I discovered, you know, Book of the Law and the Cairo working. Um, so, which he refers to quite a bit actually in this letter. Um, so it's, it's cool because he kind of like pulls from that and he's like, here's, here are three examples that were really important um, and kind of illustrate like what I'm talking about. When I talk about engaging with sort of these disincarnate um, intelligences. Um, and I think we did talk a little bit before uh, in the Tao uh, chapter that we covered you know, he talked about making um, contact with, uh, what was it, Amalanth <laughs> Lamb, essentially. Am Amalantra, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was a different, uh, you know, disincarnate intelligence that, he, intelligence that he was like interacting with. And it wasn't a person sitting in the room with him. It was like, you know, this voice in his head um, or like this series of synchronicities that kind of lined up for him, mm -hmm. um, you know. I think the losing, you know, his story about losing the, the book of the law for a number of years or, you know, for a period of time anyway, was, um, it felt familiar. I mean, I think we've all kind of had that experience, maybe not with such a, you know, uh, you know, uh, on that, of that magnitude, but certainly, um, you know, you look all over for something, you can't find it, you can't find it anywhere. And then something clicks, 
you're looking for something completely different and lo and behold, there's the thing that you've been looking for all that time. I think it's a, a, a kind of down to earth common experience, but for him, obviously this is a, a much more, uh, much more magnitude. Yeah, it's funny because I was reading these and I was like, these just seem so kooky, you know, like what, why are they so important? But when you kind of pull back a little bit, you know, you start to realize that they're all about him executing his true will, you know, and these kind of synchronicities line up in a way that he's like, oh, I, I really need to like pursue my true will. I'm, I'm you know, I'm not doing that. And, uh, you know, the first one uh, that he, the first, anecdote it's all anecdotal um you know the first one is that he makes a trip to scotland he goes to volskin um his favorite little place uh near loch ness and um where he does you know sort of the Abermellon working very famous uh, location for coley and he wants to go find paintings of the four elemental watchtowers uh because he's writing something on you know john d edward kelly and also a pair of skis <laughs> for a friend uh, so there's two people with him and he's like, I got to get these skis to loan out to this guy. Um, and then, you know, they wanted to do like an AA ritual uh, as well. So they're just kind of hanging out. Um, and, you know, he says like this casual circumstances, per, circumstance provide an essential part of the chain by which I was ultimately dragged by the chariot of the secret chiefs. Um, and this one is interesting because he doesn't, uh, he doesn't say he heard a voice or even really had like a deep, sustained contact it was just sort of like this it the world lined up so that he would find the man the lost manuscripts um, of Lieber all that he says he kind of lost on purpose yeah and I think that you know the conclusion that he had or you know part of that led him to realize that how much of he had been resisting that uh, you know that the you know book of the law was um was part of his will to carry out and he'd been trying to push it away for so long but then here it is again right in his face yeah it's funny because he kind of talks a little bit about rose his first wife um who was involved she was kind of the one who sort of made actually made first contact with iwas and was like hey they, they need to talk to you about about this thing and you know if you know about the writing of the book of the law um, you know, they're on their honeymoon in Egypt and he's trying to impress her and all of a sudden she's the one who's like, hey, I'm, I'm hearing something. <laughs> um, so, and that's referenced later as well in this letter about, the, you know, disincarnate spirits talking to his girlfriends or wives or whatever. Um, you know, he talks about Rose. Uh, he can't find like these paintings that he thinks maybe she pawned and destroyed them in an alcoholic fit. Uh, she, she did suffer from alcoholism and later like was, you know, co committed, which is sort of sad. Um, uh, that that's how his first uh, marriage sort of broke up. Um, and then he's, you know, he, he did one last search of the paintings after playing like billiards all night and he, he found them. Uh, he found the painting and he found the skis. He looked over, he's like, oh, there's the skis. And then underneath the ski was, uh, I guess, the book of the law. So if he hadn't been looking for those things, then um, we never would have had Libra we all and Crowley never would have fulfilled his true will, I guess. Um, so, you know, and that's, I think that's kind of, interesting like you know rex brought up the idea of synchronicities and that was a huge thing that young kind of invented that term it wasn't really um something that was like in common parlance until maybe the 40s or 50s when young was kind of brought into the mainstream consciousness but um you know often like in our own lives when we start to like have these synchronicities it does feel like we are kind of living you know in a more spiritual realm at least for myself, you know, I, I find that when I'm doing things that are really like uh, feel really true and right, synchronicities start happening, and it be, almost becomes like a cosmic joke. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah, I think I think that's that's true. There um, there is that aspect of of magic or of um, of daily experience that goes along with once you start once you start performing magic or, or um, you know doing ritual practices and kind of aligning yourself to your true will. It's like, um, you know, we call them synchronicities, you know, coincidences or whatever you want, whatever word you want to use, but really um, it's, it's an example of the universe lining up certain events for your benefit or for your understanding or your, for your education you know, in many ways. 
So it's, I think we all have those experiences. We may not always interpret them the same way or as, as deeply as, as some of what Crowley is reading into this, um, these experiences, but, but I think we all have them. Yeah, and I think too, like this really speaks to Crowley's like rich inner world. Like he was like looking for meaning, you know, that, that is kind of what the brain does. The brain looks for patterns and meanings. Um, you know, when that dysfunctions, it can be, you know, like hallucinations and schizophrenia, but when it, when you have a, a little bit of an objective grasp and discipline and, you know, obviously like with schizophrenia, that, that, that can have like physiological aspects to it. Um, but you know, that like, oh my God, everything just makes sense and is lining up. It can be sort of overwhelming. But for Crowley, he took it and was like, no, this is like my true will and I've been avoiding it. He says, you know, the practical point of my resuming the task laid upon me in Cairo exactly as I might be directed to do by my superiors, you know, and after he sort of accepts that he needs to like, um, uh, you know, spread the good word <laughs> about, you know, the book of the law, uh, you know, he says instantly my burden fell from my back, the long crucifixion of home life uh, came to a crisis immediately upon my return to London. Uh, at the same time, every other inhibition was automatically removed. Uh, from the first time since the spring of 1904, I felt myself free to do my will. That, of course, was because I had last understood what my will was. My aspiration to be the means of emancipating humanity was perfectly fulfilled. I had to, merely to establish in the world the law which is given to me to proclaim. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. Um, so big stuff for him, you know. Um, and then he's even like, you know, I feel like I spent the flat past five years like just wasting them. He's like, I, I'm still suffering to this day from the effects of having wasted some of the best years of my life and that stupid and stubborn struggle uh, to set up my conscious self against its silent sovereign, my true soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that kind of ties back to his definition of magic. Um, you know, we talked about that in an earlier class where um, you know, every, every, intentional act is, is an act of magic and uh, when you're doing your true will you have the the inertia of the universe behind you and um, it kind of ties into all of those concepts that that Crowley has talked about all along yeah it's interesting too that like that's the point where he finds his true will you know where he's like no I like I feel like there are you know points maybe in the golden dawn or um you know, earlier in his career where he would have sort of figured that out, but it wasn't until, you know, this period where he refound the book of the law that he kind of like really, um, you know, his true will was sort of like really revealed to him. So that's kind of, I guess, a very important moment. <laughs> Obviously he wrote about it. Um, and then moving on to the second incident, uh, it involves one of my favorite Scarlet women, um, Sir Vircom or uh, Mary Dusty Sturges. Um, and just for film buffs out there, her son is uh, this comedy writer, director, Preston Sturges from the 30s and 40s. Uh, he's one of the greatest comedy writers and directors <laughs> of the early period. Uh, if you haven't seen like uh, The Great McGinty or um, I think it's The Lady Eve, they're, they're really great films. I'm always funny. It's always funny to me when like um, Preston Sturges' mom comes in. <laughs> comes into the, the mix. Um, and he even mentions, really even mentions uh, Preston Surges uh, in this letter as a brat. <laughs> so, I don't think they liked each other. Um, and I, he's, uh, so he's hanging out, at, apparently it's Isadora Duncan, the famous dancer, I believe, or is she an actress? Um, dancer, uh, at her birthday party. And, you know, he meets uh, Sora Vikram, uh, she used to become, and uh, they decide to just take off uh, and go gallivanting. Uh, I think he wants to go skating in Switzerland with her for the winter. So, and then they end up at like the Hotel Zurich and um, just like, uh, you know, on his honeymoon with Rose, uh, when the Book of the Law happened, uh, you know, all of a sudden like Sor uh, Virakam, apparently she was seized with a violent attack of hysteria, he says, and he, uh, she poured with a frantic torrent of senseless hallucination. She insisted that her experiences was real. You know, she's having basically this like, uh, this experience that he is like, I don't know what's happening. She's like, no, no, there's an important message for you uh, from an invisible person. <laughs> 
And, um, you know, all of a sudden he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And all of a sudden he says, I became aware of a coherence in her raving and further that they were couched in my own language of symbols. My attention being thus awakened, I listened to what she was saying. A few minutes convinced me she was actually in communication with some intelligence uh, that had a message for me. So this is very much like, you know, the writing of the book of the law, his, his former, uh, his ex-wife had a very similar thing where she was like, hey, someone's trying to get your attention, you know? Um, and then he mentions, it was clear uh, that the main, uh, the person in this vision, the man who she called Abu uh, Diaz was acquainted with a syst my system Crowley system of hieroglyphics, literal and numerical, and also with some uh, incidents in my magical career, which like she had just met this guy, she didn't know anything about these things. Um, you know, she wasn't into magic at all. You know, even I think he said it's like she's never even done, you know, a, like a seance or you know, a Ouija board. <laughs> so um, he, you know, Crowley was like, oh, you're actually like this is just like my ex wife. You're like channeling these. Uh, you know, these symbols that only are meaningful to me. Um, and I'm, then, I'm guessing that must have tied into some gematria or some other kind of, those are the numerical and uh, hieroglyphs that he's talking about, or just his, you know, he was talking his language in, the, in that regard. Yeah, and it's funny because, you know, uh, and just like kind of the, the Cairo working in that period, uh, you know, it seems like there were some personality issues around receiving the messages from uh, Abdul, Yes, uh, Vikram, he says, was really impulsive and would just be like, oh, let's do this crazy thing. And Crowley was really skeptical. He was like, I don't, I don't think what you're saying is real, um, you know, which actually kind of screwed up, uh, you know, Crowley's ability to communicate properly and to receive the message. Um, and the synchronicity that he really lined up was that, like, the the spirit that was talking to him was basically like, you have to have these exact weapons to do, the, to do the ritual and, um, you know, I want you to wear like, it's basically like a, he had a blue robe and she had like, or he had a red robe, I believe, and she had a blue robe and the blue robe she pulled out was exactly like his ex-wife Rose's robe. <laughs> and he took that to be really significant. Um, and basically like what uh, this spirit wanted him to do, this master, secret chief, whatever, was write book four, um, the big, blue brick, brick that we all know and love, uh, Magic ABA. Um, so that's kind of the, the message he was trying to communicate. Um, and then kind of further onto that, uh, you know, the messenger was like, okay, like you're in Zurich, I want you to go to Milan. They went to Milan. Um, and then it was like, no, no, Milan's not right. Like go to Rome. I think they like drove to, to Naples to the coast. Um, and basically like oh, in Milan, Abdul Diaz was, you know, was like, you need to find this villa. Um, and he says, he flashed a message directly into my consciousness. You will recognize it beyond the possibility of doubt or error. And with a picture came to mind of a hillside on which there was a house and garden marked by two tall, uh, Persian nuts. So, you know. He's got this message, he's got an image, um, you know, they're, they decide to like go with it. They decide that this is important enough that they should try to pursue a villa, you know, to write book four in. Um, and then he mentions Preston Sturges, Vikram's brat, <laughs> almost God forsaken lout was to join us for the Christmas holidays. I think the kid was like 13. <laughs> Uh, no, I just imagine Crowley being kind of like it's W.C. Fields character, <laughs> didn't like children, you know. Um, so they were going to pick up Preston at little young Preston at, uh, at a train station. And, you know, uh, Mary Desty had this sort of vision or dream the night before of where the villa was that they were searching for. So they drive and they drive and she's like, no, you have to go down this road and they drive and um, eventually they find it. Uh, Villa Catazero and Crowley sees the two nut trees. Um, he actually didn't mention the nut trees to uh, Sora Vikram just because he didn't want her to know about them. So he could kind of verify like 
oh, well, if she knows about the nut trees, then she might try to pick it out. So I'm not going to tell her, you know, <laughs> and just see what she picks out. Um, yeah, I think that's a good example of the way he tests the, these types of entities and, and these types of experiences, um, whether it's in the physical world or even, you know, as we talked about, um, the kind of testing that you do on the astral. I think it's the similar kind of process that you go through where you have, uh, you know, withhold some information and, and see, see uh, if it gets verified. Yeah, Gematria is a really great way of, you know, if you do feel like maybe you're having some sort of intuitive knowledge um, or synchronicities, you know, they even say like in dreams, you know, write down the names of people and things. And, you know, if it sticks around with you long enough and is a theme, then maybe do some Gematria around like names and letters that come up. And it is a really good way to kind of um, get some verification that what you're pursuing, you know, has some validity, um, you know, in, in sort of that world of Kabbalistic validity, I suppose. Um, you know, so uh, I guess he does the Gematria real quick, uh, you know, he's been trained. <laughs> so uh, Villa Caldezero, um, you know, is basically adds up Kabbalistically to 418, which is the magical formula of the Aeon uh, numerical hieroglyph, it's a great work. So he's like, will take it and he convinces the people to, the people who, um, the guy who owns the house to rent it out to them. And that's where they wrote uh, book four. So we should all be very happy. I think, I think Preston, there's a, I, I was looking, I was just obsessed with Preston Sturgis. just was looking at his biography and he was like, yeah, I stayed, I stayed there for the Christmas holiday at that villa. It was weird. I don't, I don't like Crowley. <laughs> I think he was like, you know, cutting his mom or doing something a little weird, you know, probably has a little sadomasochistic. <laughs> so that's another example. Um, and then he says also, uh, there's a chapter called uh, Secret Chiefs, uh, chapter nine in Magic Without Tears, um, where he does talk about this, uh, this, you know, secret chief or entity, uh, Abdul Diaz. Um, is Abdul Diaz an adept who can project himself into the aura of some women with who, woman with whom I happen to be living, although she has no previous experience of the kind or any interest in such matters at all? Or is he a being who exists, whose existence is altogether beyond this plane, only adopting human appearance and faculties in order to make himself sensible and intelligible to that woman? So it's a little bit of like, you know, Crowley kind of wondering um, why this, person keeps talking to his girlfriend. <laughs> so, kind of funny. And, you know, I think, uh, I always think it's interesting that like, you know, for Crowley to receive uh, these really important things, he has to listen to a woman, um, you know, sort of like, hey, she's talking and you need to listen to her. Cause you know, obviously like you're maybe not able to receive this yourself in the same way that, um, she, you know, your, your partner is. And that's kind of common sometimes when you're doing um, sort of like scrying work, especially like John Dee and Edward Kelly, you know, obviously they're sort of some of the most famous, um, you know, people who like did sort of channeling of spirits and medium work and angels and scrying. And um, John Dee really couldn't uh, make contact with disincarnate intelligences. He needed Edward Kelly and Edward Kelly was actually the person who was like, oh, I, I see this angel in the room and they're telling me things. And uh, John Dee was the one kind of writing them down and like asking questions, but he needed an inter, um, you know, intermediate person uh, who is like more psychically sensitive. Um, you know, so it's, it's pretty typical. Sometimes you see that uh, in this sort of world of contacting, you know, disembodied intelligences. Uh, and then the third, um, anecdote that we talk about it's 1919 and he's really destitute and he's just like you know I, I made this promise I would take care of a person and I couldn't I was penniless I was like saddled obligations having issues with his publishers there's a gang of people causing problems I don't I don't I'm not sure what the what that was about probably in confessions it outlines it more um and uh you know, it's sort of interesting because he just decides to consult his uh, divinatory method, the E King. Um, you know, we talked about that before a little bit, I believe. Uh, you know, he wrote his own um, E King uh, 
and I kind of, I, I'm not super familiar with it. Uh, so, you know, I only have, uh, you know, I looked up each of these um, interpretations. Um, Rex, how familiar are you with Yi King? I, I'm, I'm not that familiar with it, to be honest with you. I, um, I've used the Yi Ching quite a lot, but um, I also had to look up these, these, uh, you know, uh, hexagrams, hexagrams to see what, what he was getting at. Um, but I think, you know, the, the gist of it is he saw confirmation within these symbols of, of, uh, you know, there was messages there. And that's, I think, you know, that just speaks to the system of divination in general, but his, his favorite was the I Ching and he uh, had these wooden sticks that he used. I don't think he typically used coins or um, the yarrow stocks or anything like that. He had these kind of flattened uh, wooden sticks that were marked or painted and he used those typically for his for his readings. Yeah, I think this is his favorite method of divination. I mean, you know, we hear him talk tangentially about astrology and tarot, but I think when he really wanted answers, he would go to the I Ching and cast those sticks and, you know, get messages. Um, so his first question, you know, in this instance was, shall I abandon all magical work whatsoever until the appearance of a manifest sign? And he gets, uh, this is, I believe, 22, um, the pi hexagram. Uh, it's, I believe, this is the Wilhelm, um, the sort of famous uh, Wilhelm, uh, Richard Wilhelm translation, grace has success in small matters. It is favorable to undertake something is one of the translations I found. Mm -hmm. um, so Crowley was like, oh, cool. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. <laughs> so it confirmed for him, you know, that he, he can move forward and he will have success. I think it's the earth of sun. Uh, I looked at Crowley's kind of translation. Mm -hmm. Earth over sun, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then he kind of wanted some more sort of confirmation and he got sort of two hexagrams, one he got, he got one hexagram, hexagram 36 Ming, the darkening of the light, but he was like, really, it should be this other one piece, uh, hexagram 11. <laughs> I wasn't really sure why he wanted 11. I, I think, I think that's because of the opposites here. Like he, it's the, um, the three broken lines over the three solid lines and it's just the nature of, um, I mean, those are the two extremes of the union, yeah. and the union of opposites, I think, is what he was going for there. Yeah, he kind of related it to Nui and Hidi, you know, wanting to have, like, confirmation that he should pursue uh, Nui. And it's interesting, because I looked up, you know, uh, the original hexagram that he drew, um, you know, the Ming hexagram, and I thought it was actually really sort of appropriate, um, the darkening of the light in adversity, in, uh, in adversity, it furthers one to be persevering. Um, one, one must not unresistingly let himself be swept along by unfavorable circumstances, nor permit his steady fastness to be shaken. You know, I was like, oh, that's it. That's a pretty great answer. <laughs> and even the darkening of the light to me seems like a, almost like a something from the book of the law, you know, like new eat sort of coming over and overtaking because he keeps referencing like that one line from Liber all the omnipresence of my body. Um, so and then he goes on he's like so I, I pulled these uh, hexagrams and I thought they were awesome. Um, and then I went to visit a friend because I wanted to like smoke opium and make love. <laughs> like you do. As one does and see if her new boyfriend was around. Um, or a man she was living with. And uh, all of a sudden she's like, hold on, I have a different, I have something I need to show you. So she's like, close your eyes. And she pulls out this huge cloth, uh, four feet or more in length, which is a magnificent copy, uh, mostly an applique silk of the stele of revealing. Um, and he was like, oh, awesome. Like he wasn't expecting her, especially, you know, to have this beautiful rendition that she made. Um, I believe he also references this in the Secret Chiefs chapter in chapter nine, where he talks about it can make a, a young woman make a tapestry. Um, this sort of like communication. So this is another synchronicity that he really resonates with because you know why would she make the stellar revealing? But for some reason she was trying to kick opium, I guess, and she was up late one night. She's like, I need to draw this. Uh, the stellar revealing, obviously, if you if you don't know. 
um, it's the Egyptian Stele that Rose, his first wife, sort of pointed out as like kind of a message to Crowley. She was like, um, hold on, Rex, can you take over for one sec? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, the Stele is uh, significant for its uh, the symbolism of Nuit, the overarching body of Nuit, and uh, Hadith in the center. Um, and, you know, long story short, um, through a series of, of uh, visions that Rose had had, uh, led him to find this, this stele in the Egyptian uh, in the Cairo Museum, uh, which the display number was uh, 666, was the, the display number on uh, uh, for the museum. So for Crowley, that, you know, totally blew his mind, of course. And, uh, and just simply proved that you know what Rose had been, her visions had been true all along, and that this stele was a, a very significant artifact in in, uh, in Crowley's vision and in you know in his true will and Chris Bellino in, in general. Um, so this this ties in you know all of these uh, all of these uh, I Ching readings had been kind of pointing to the body of wheat and. Um, to passages of the Book of the Law, and then here was this cloth that he was presented, you know, from from this young woman uh, that showed essentially the stele of the deal. So another mind blowing moment for him. Yeah, the stele, you know, is something like the Book of the Law says you should have a copy of it and you should hang it in your temple, like in the East. It's it's a source of power um, for Thalamites. So the fact that she had made it was just like, oh, like all right, there's my true will, there's my sign again, this, this like thread um, that leads back to the Cairo working and this, this sort of the book of the law, he couldn't escape it. Um, you know, so the, that's that chapter, um, you know, which I think is, to me, it was just like a really good insight into, you know, magician who's living in this really rich inner world of their symbols and, you know, like, actively like able to receive signs and like follow sort of like directives once you know once they verify um in you know in his own way that this is something you know important um you know obviously like if you start to see signs everywhere and try to verify everything you know <laughs> you need to take a step back so you know the fact that he was like skeptical of all of this uh, i think is really important um you know you don't want to you take opium, you see a lot of crazy stuff sometimes. <laughs> so you want to have a good head on your shoulders and know when something is important and when something is like, you know, okay, I'm just being a little kooky and weird. Um, and so moving on to like the other chapter that I was hoping we could discuss, uh, chapter 61, Power and Authority. Um, you know, that was like Crowley's inner world. So here's Crowley trying to tell people, okay, well, that's, you know, that's my authority and that's where my power comes from. And here is like the nature of power and authority in the AA, especially, um, you know, and he, he talks about it. It's because it's kind of, you sort of see this, um, you know, and he says, as soon as anybody gets into a position of authority, even on a small scale, their troubles begin on a very large one, you know, and the nature of authority um, and people like feeling like their authorities, it can be pretty, uh, can be kind of dangerous. Um, you know, people like their sort of egos get inflated and, you know, um, they kind of like sort of lose themselves and lose like that power of the inner world even sometimes, I think. I thought too, it was interesting how he, you know, he describes <clears throat> people who chase degrees, for example, or people who are chasing for accomplishments and, um, he uses the example of, uh, you know, the Church of Rome, for example, um, in the ordaining of priests. Um, you know, they can ordain anybody. They can ordain a, you know, a cobbler, um, but that doesn't mean that they can. Yeah, you know, and as long as they follow the the, as long as they follow the practices and say the right words, then then they're good to go. But then he contrasts that with the work of the AA or the work of uh, you know, of uh, the Lima. And I thought the contrast there was was interesting because he, as he puts it, you know, um, there are accomplishments that go along with the title. Um, 
in the AAA, they're not just handing out titles to people who, who want to write a check. You know, it's, you're actually accomplishing the work in order to gain the title. So you, you have a certain guarantee. And that's where that authority comes from, is that guarantee that you know that someone who is of a certain degree, of a certain uh, grade in the AAA, then uh, they've done that. They've done that work. Yeah, I think too Crowley is really emphasizing like the lived experience of, you know, like gaining a skill set, um, you know, and he, he contrasts like, you know, he says this bishop, they could be anybody, they just like learn a formula and perform it and boom, a miracle. But, you know, you can't, uh, you can't put a, like a, a shoemaker, a cobbler into the head of the royal science, a scientific, uh, you know, society and expect them just because they're in that position to know how to make, you know, a, a perform a boiling point determination, like make it a, a, you know, a calculation of a, you know, a chemical element or, you know, read a, a veneer, which is like a, a measuring device scale. You know, you can't just like put someone in a position of authority and expect them to all of a sudden gain skills. Um, the skills have to be like earned, uh, you know, and that's what, you know, as Rex, so eloquently put, you have to have the uh, the work done before you can like have the degree um, applied to you, um, and that's what Crowley really wants to emphasize. Um, you know, I feel like that was the main point of this. Really, I mean, there's a lot of words here, but uh, what it came down to really was, at least for me, that was the main point that he was trying to make: was, um, that assurance that you get from knowing that you know someone has done the work rather than just paid some money to get the to get the title. Yeah, and I think you'll you know you kind of find that a lot. I think magic in the past maybe three or four years has become really hip. You know, and you'll find people being like, oh, I have a magical order and like you can join it. But, you know, you kind of don't really know what you're getting into. You know, if this person like hasn't written a book or doesn't have any like demonstrable like uh, theory for you to analyze or like, you know, you're like, I, I don't I don't know why I should trust or believe you. You know, um, I know Crowley often said like, you know, you'll know the the tree by the fruit it bears. So sometimes you can like see what sort of people they hang out with and are, are they like good mag magicians? Are they like trustworthy, intelligent people? Um, but, you know, it is kind of like, you know, glamorous. <laughs> there is a lot of glamor in like saying that you're a powerful magician, um, you know, and just wanting to impress people. Uh, so I think Crowley kind of makes it a point like, well, yeah, that's cool. I mean, you know, you can, I think at one point he says uh, something about how important it would be, how much more important it is to like have a rich inner world where you make like a verifiable connection with like a, you know, a secret chief that you can be like, oh, I did the Kabbalah and it's really meaningful to me rather than have like an audience of a thousand. Uh, I might say, in fact, that one such experience of the secret guardianships of the chiefs of the order is worth a thousand apparently sufficient witnesses to the facts you know so it to me it kind of does state like it's it really is about like doing the inner work um you know writing in your journal and you know doing like meditations and you know performing like rituals on a daily basis when no one is watching and through having those experiences of yourself um you kind of like really get the you earn the degrees and the grades and the, the power. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And the 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 system of the AA, as as Crowley envisioned it too, was a kind of a teacher student line of you know uh, you're really only in contact with one person in the order, and that's your that's your teacher. And um, of course, that you know whether that's, you know, that's at its purest form. I, mean, I don't think that that's really the case today. And it's a lot more or less, uh, you actually have more interaction with, with more people in the order as such as it is. But, um, but that line of succession or that line of transmission is, is the key. And, and as long as you're confident that your teacher knows what they're, you know, that they've accomplished what they've, that they have done the work for their, for their particular grade and you're, you're approaching that grade um, I think it's a it's a real simple system from that from that standpoint. Yeah, he's pretty. He kind of rages against uh, 
socialization in this mm -hmm. quite a bit. Um, you know, AA is sort of, it really is supposed to be like more just, just teacher student or that's how we designed it and intended. And like OTO is kind of like the fraternal order where you can socialize. Um, I feel really fortunate. The Temple of the Silver Star is kind of um, a little bit more uh, social, you know, um, especially, you know, um, you know, we have the academic one, which is the little teacher student, but then the initiatory, you know, there's more um, sort of you meet people who are interested in Philema and, you know, it provides a community, but there is an intense, uh, you know, sort of like learning aspect to it. And like, you really do have to, to do the work um, <clears throat> within the Temple of the Silver Star. So uh, that's kind of nice um, if you're craving community um, and don't, you know, yet feel like you want to join AA. Uh, that's my little oh. sales pitch. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, you know, not to not to put too fine a point on it. I think that is one of the benefits of, of Temple of the Silver Star in that and that's one of the reasons why I joined, because um, the OTO is is a is a good order. It's a more of a fraternal order and a social order, but it's not really a teaching order. And so when I realized that I wanted more of a teaching experience, um, but I didn't really want a one on one teaching experience. That's, that's what I, I got the kind of in between happy medium with, uh, with Todd's. And so it's been for me, it's been very, very good. Yeah, and it's, it's funny, because you know, Crowley, um, and I'm always like, well, would Crowley approve of me, like knowing all these cell <laughs> And uh, You know, he says anything in this letter, he says anything like fraternization leads only to mischief. When you wish to instruction from your superior, it should be definite points and nothing else. Any breach of this convention is almost certain to lead to one kind of trouble or another. Um, you know, we all, we all can name some trouble that's happened and with our friends and various thelemic organizations and magical orders, you know, they, there just seem to be like a lot of big personalities and, you know, ritual magicians love drama, <laughs> you know, <laughs> on the floor and off. Um, so, you know, there's that kind of theater kid aspect to it too. Um, but, I, and I, I do think there is an important thing here as well, uh, what he's saying um, for myself, uh, you know, I have found that like, it's really important to have my own internal symbol sets and for those to be coming from like a real genuine verified place within me. And if you have a lot of other people around you, especially if they're doing like similar practices to you and they're sharing their experiences, sometimes it can kind of, I almost want to say contaminate your experience. Like if someone's like, oh, I don't like that. I don't do that. It's boring. You might to kind of you might take on some of that energy and it might sort of block your progress where if you'd never had that conversation, you know, you might be like, oh, actually, I really love this, <laughs> you know, so other people's opinions um, can can really affect you uh, when you're doing this kind of really, you know, work of like sensitizing yourself, um, especially. It's my two cents. Agreed. So um, I guess we can just sort of open it up. I don't, you know, I don't think there's too much uh, more to go on here. Um, you know, does anyone have any questions or comments about, you know, the secret chiefs and angels or power and authority they wanted to talk about or ask? I don't know whether this has been addressed before, but it appears to me like the titles of the articles might have been tacked on later. Yeah. Well, they're, they're letters, you know, he's like writing a series of letters. So, you know, I don't know if it was intended to be a book, like off the bat, he was more like, well, we'll just do a bunch of letters and then kind of, you know, uh, it was published after he died too. So he might have never even seen the titles that were tacked on. Um, you know, they might have been added by the editor. I, th I think I think he had some intention of it being a book, but I don't know that um, each chapter was named ahead of time. I, I have a feeling it probably was tacked on afterwards. Um, if not by Crowley, then by by someone who was editing. But I think the original title was going to be something like Alistair Knows Everything. Alistair Explains Everything? Explains Everything. Yeah, it was something like that was the original title. And um, and I think it was intended to be a book uh, based on correspondences. But beyond that, I don't know. Um, we may be able to find out more of that history um, when we have like the last... Uh, our last class in the series, we're going to have a special guest speaker. Yeah, it's really exciting. Um, I did send out like an email to our uh, TOTS public list. I'm not sure, you know, everyone got the message, but uh, 
Rex's wife, Heather Schubert, uh, is an amazing occultist and writer herself. And she's been researching Magic Without Tears and sort of like the person who was on the other end of some of these letters. And so our last class, um, we'll still do probably like half an hour, but then the second half of the class, we'll leave a half an hour, um, go a little longer, and she's gonna do a presentation on some of the uh, history behind Magic Without Tears. So we're really excited. That'll be February 10th um, when we're doing that. So. You know, if you have questions for Heather, save them up. We'd love, we'd love to, you know, throw what we can at her and see, <laughs> see what she knows. Um, yeah, yeah. It, there, I especially like the first letter that we went over, chapter fifty-one. That that title was a little strange, <laughs> you know. Yeah. But I think some of it too reflects Crowley's logic, you know, where he's like, "I'll tell you about angels and secret chiefs," but then it's just, you know, you know from his autobiography. And I think it's it's clear too that they aren't really in order. Like um, I think at the beginning of chapter or this um, letter fifty one, I think it refers to it. It says in my previous, in our last letter, and it was actually chapter seven or something like that. So they're clearly not. These aren't presented in chronological order. I don't think anyone made an attempt to to do that. Yeah, they're not really sequential, I guess. So mm. they're very conversational, which is kind of nice. Um, I think that's kind of why people recommend Magic Without Tears is sort of the conversational nature is a little less intimidating. Some of his other work. Um, anybody else have anything that they wanted to talk about with these? Any experiences with synchronicities and secret chiefs? Might not want to brag about it. <laughs> Keep it in your, in your inner world until you publish your thesis. Sweet. Well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been a great night. Thank you, 93s. Thanks so much. Um, and yeah, so next uh, next week, next Wednesday, January 27th, uh, we'll be going over chapters 63 and 74. Uh, 63 is um, fear, a bad astral vision, and 74 is obstacles on the path. So uh, I, I think those two kind of go together. Um, and I just posted them if you want to read them ahead of time. Um, I obviously, you know, I post them in Facebook too and, uh, you know, send people messages so they can read beforehand if they want. Thank you. Thank you. All right, you guys have a, have a great night. Enjoy your wines that foam or whatever you're drinking, tea, <laughs> celebrational <laughs> tea. <laughs> All right, have a good week. All right. Good night. 93 is everyone.